Today I wanted to do a reaction video of an Arvin Ash video. What is a particle? A visual explanation of quantum field theory. And the reason I wanted to do that is his visual explanation of quantum field theory is all wrong and his verbal explanation of quantum field is also wrong. Although the what is a particle theory part of it is eh, okay I guess considering. And normally I don't look at his videos because he is more careful than some people in terms of how he states things scientifically. He states things that are more hypothetical and more likely to be overturned in a, in a way, I mean he's honest about it and he seems like a good a good guy but this time he completely blew the quantum field theory part and I really think he should retract it but with that I'll let him give you the intro more than 2,000 years ago the Greek philosopher Democritus first coined the term atom meaning uncuttable something you can't split into smaller pieces if you take a piece of metal and cut it in half then cut it in half again and do this over and over again he figured there must be a smallest piece of metal that cannot be cut any further. And so it must be the fundamental particle of the material, the atom. This search for a deeper understanding of the fundamental nature of matter has brought mankind to the physics of today. And we now have an understanding that the ancient Greeks could not have even dreamed about. So what do we know now that Democritus didn't know? After 2000 years, we have today the standard model of particle physics, which is like the periodic table of fundamental particles. These are the particles that almost everything in the universe reduces to. But the question is, what really are fundamental particles? Can we say what they're made of? The answer, which may surprise you, is coming up right now. Well, the intro is not too terrible any more than any other intro for a similar type video that you find on YouTube. Except that you have this blue waves representation of the quantum field which is utter nonsense. To give you a better idea of what of how it should be represented I'll show you a really short clip from a Don Lincoln Fermilab video that does a better job. So, check this out. The image you're seeing gives you an idea of the smallest quantum reality. The flickering colors represent the constant creation and destruction of matter and antimatter. Electrons and antimatter electrons, quarks and antimatter quarks, they are created from nothing and disappear back into nothingness. We can see that when we look at what is going on at the smallest and most quantum of scales, that empty space is actually extremely busy. Scientists have a name for these effervescent subatomic objects. They are called virtual particles. So you see in the Fermi Lab video, quantum fluctuations are particle pairs that briefly come into and out of existence. They'll go like this, out and back, or maybe they'll move, or maybe they'll rotate. But it's as simple as that. That's all it is. It's a half wavelength. If anyone is talking about quantum fluctuations and they show you more than a half wavelength, then they either don't know what they're talking about or they really didn't think it through. And so we'll see in the rest of the video that I talk about that Arvin Ash's video is just completely wrong. And on the other part I want to mention about quarks, that if we look at a proton, physicists consider that the shell that causes the scattering at the charge radius, that this shell is made of quantum fluctuations. And I've shown that all the properties of the proton can be accounted for the mass, the charge, the magnetic moment, spin, angular momentum, all the fundamental properties are properties of the shell. They have nothing to do with a quark. So quarks are completely unnecessary. As well as I've shown that any of the more 
or heavier resonances can be accounted for with using electron-positron pairs or electron-positron pairs and protons in the case of baryons. So quarks are completely unnecessary. And it appears that both the proton and electron, the two fundamental permanently stable particles, are made of a quantum shell of quantum fluctuations and that it's the quantum fluctuations that are the fundamental particles. And with that, I skip ahead a little bit in the, there's more information about particle theory and go into the quantum field theory where Arvind Ash makes his biggest mistakes. And so here's that clip. In the 1930s, scientists realized that one could get an even better formulation of quantum mechanics than what physicists like Schrodinger achieved by considering quantum objects in terms of quantized fields. When this is done, the equations of quantum mechanics could be modified to account for special relativity by treating space and time equally. This led to quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, what we call particles are quantized waves in a field that spreads throughout space-time. The idea of quantized fields was a necessary step in order to describe objects like photons and other fast-moving objects that demand to be treated according to the rules of special relativity, which starts to have a significant effect at or close to the speed of light. Quantum field theory is nothing but a theoretical framework that unites ideas from classical fields, special relativity, and quantum mechanics. The idea is like this. You start with a field, or analogously, picture yourself a COM C. This is an empty field without any particles. This is our starting point. It may sound a little bit weird, but stay with me here. Imagine that this field or C stretches throughout all of space-time. Note that this would be in three dimensions, but for visualization purposes, we are representing this in two dimensions, like the surface of the ocean. Now imagine that there is a wave in the C. This is a particle in our field. Then there can be another wave, which represents another particle. In the field, each particle is an excitation of the field, just like a wave in the sea. Because we are considering our particles as waves, if we collide them, the particles collide like waves, just as in the double slit experiment. There is, however, at least one difference between the quantum field and our ocean. Our ocean is not quantum. For our ocean field to be quantum, we have two requirements. First, the waves in our sea must have some discrete magnitude because in quantum mechanics, things have discrete quantizations. This can be represented by the amplitude or height of the wave. Let's say the wave can be one meter, two meters, three meters, and so on. Each meter corresponds to the number of particles in any one place. But there's a second requirement too. A real quantum field is never calm. It always has some minimum energy state. So we will say that the one meter wave represents this minimum energy state of the field. The minimum energy of one meter is called the vacuum energy. It means that for a real quantum field, empty doesn't mean nothing. There's still something, some minimum energy present. Then each extra meter of amplitude or height is a real particle. Now, the interesting thing about quantum waves is that we can only create taller waves in increments of whole meters. So one of the first things to note is that the way this graphical representation is done, it's, it's showing the dimensions changing to form a wave. And that's, the physical dimensions don't form waves. That's not how it happens. You have quantum particle pairs in the quantum field are rotating to form waves. They're polarizing or they're magnetizing to form waves. The way that's graphically represented is nonsense. And then you have, he says time is a dimension, time is not a physical dimension. Time, time is related to frequency, dimensions are related to wavelengths. And then he says we get quantum field theory from relativity, which isn't true, although relativity is incorporated. The quantum field theory emerged from Max Planck's use of the quantum oscillators or resonators and understanding that energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. And he misstates it's the field, that the quantum field is the fundamental entity. There aren't waves and then a quantum field on top of 
waves with nothing. The waves have to have a medium, and the medium is the quantum field. The waves and particles are made of quantum field. And then he says the fields are quantized, which is incorrect. Each of the quantum fluctuations is quantized because energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. But what he doesn't say is the frequency can be anything except for zero and infinity. There's no amplitude. There's no quantization by amplitude. There's no amplitude limit. It's not a thing in physics. It's completely wrong. And as I said before, you only get a half wavelength. So you can't have waves propagating over and over and over again. All you get with quantum fluctuations is one half wavelength. That's it. Because that's E equals HF. That's how much energy you get is one half wavelength. And you don't get long waves that are quantum fluctuations because that requires multiple quantum fluctuations in a series all acting together and they don't behave that way. They behave more like the Fermi Lab video where you just get random individual quantum fluctuations here and there that could be any wavelength energy and frequency. So you could get really big ones and really tiny ones all filled in space. And with that I'll show the last clip. The one meter waves are from the quantum vacuum. They represent the non-empty minimal state. These quantum waves slosh around, and in some places, there might be momentarily enough energy to create a large two-meter wave or a particle. But then, almost just as quickly as it's formed, the particle vanishes again in the sea of fluctuations. These are analogous to virtual particles that come in and out of existence all around us, but are undetectable because they last for too short a time. Since virtual particles cannot be directly observed, they only exist mathematically. However, they do result in other effects which can be detected, namely the Casimir effect, which happens due to a pressure difference caused by the virtual particles between the inside of two plates and outside of the plates. This is a unique effect supporting the idea that the universe consists of quantized fields rather than just quantum mechanics. The quantum field is like the sea. It's the background on which waves appear and disappear. And just like energy can create waves in the sea, energy added to the field generates particles, which we can observe. So in quantum field theory, we have a field that is never still, never empty, and we can create a particle if we have the exact amount of energy needed. But still, you should keep in mind that this is just a mathematical construct that appears to fit reality. If you expand this concept to other particles, we have to imagine other seas on top of seas representing a different field for each fundamental particle that we know of. So there would be a sea representing the field for electrons, for example, a field for photons, a field for quarks, etc. This concept led us to where we are now. So he doubles down on many of the same mistakes and he says that quantum fluctuations are mathematical, but no, there's enough evidence, although it's indirect evidence, but there's enough evidence so we know quantum fluctuations must be physically real. And then he talks about Casimir effect. Well, that's good, except he's misrepresented it again. He has quantum fluctuations that are more than half a wavelength. So this is a completely wrong representation. And the Casimir effect is due to van der Waals forces, which are forces between electric charge dipoles, and dipoles interact, and that's where the pressure comes from. So he completely misrepresents how Casimir forces are developed. And then he also says that this is a unique force. Well, and actually, that's where a lot of physicists screw up. The Casimir effect is not a unique force. It tells us that objects move because there's quantum pressure differentials. And there isn't a general solution that's accepted by all physicists 
as to what pushes objects when they're accelerated due to electromagnetic forces. But the only thing present to push is the quantum field. And that tells us the Casimir effect is not a unique process. It's the process for how bodies are accelerated. The quantum field pushes due to quantum pressure differentials. And I've done other videos on that. I'll link a couple. And then he talks about being multiple fields with different fields for different particles. And no, there isn't. There's one quantum field where the true particles have particle pairs, electron positrons, proton antiprotons. As far as I know, that's it, but there might be a couple others. But you don't need stacks of multiple fields in order to explain physics. It's overcomplicated things. So as I said in the beginning, Arvanash completely misrepresents quantum field. There is some additional parts to the video I skipped over that aren't as bad, um, although they still have some mistakes as well. And this is one video that I think he should withdraw because he shouldn't be misinforming his subscribers and other viewers. Uh, so I hope he consider that. Anyway, I hope you learned a little bit more about real quantum field theory and that you liked the video. And if you do, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about photons, I talk about what photons and quantum fluctuations are really like in my book, The Zero Point Universe. And so thanks for watching.